Well, greetings everyone. My name is Tony Decker. I'm a physician at Fort Belvoir Hospital, which is a Department of Defense hospital south of Washington, D.C. I'm the director of addiction medicine, but I am not representing the Department of Defense or the U.S. Public Health Service in this presentation, and these presentations are strictly my opinions. The topic today is going to be on mild TBI, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance abuse. The program is broken into three short vignettes, and so the first one is on mild TBI, the second one is on post-traumatic stress disorder, and the third one will be on substance abuse. Our disclosure, as I said before, is I'm not representing the U.S. government in any form. These are my personal opinions and that this presentation has no conflicts. I don't take any funds from any conflict-generating organization. Now, our first slide here is a improvised explosive device. This is one that was uh, uh, deactivated in Afghanistan. You can see that uh, they're very homemade. They have a variety of things that are put in them, either with plaster of Paris or concrete. Uh, they may be in a container. Uh, they usually have a, a variety of projectiles. What we've seen in this war is that there's been a significant increase in the number of men and women who are exposed to explosive events. These events are not very common in the U.S. Uh, what happened at the Boston Marathon is uh, hopefully not something that we're going to see on a regular basis in this country. But the reality is that these types of explosive events have a very significant impact on the way the brain is injured and on the way the brain is uh, on the way the brain functions. This is an example of a explosion. You can see a service member there in the turret of a Humvee there. Uh, but the explosive event that occurs that's close to a person has three components. There's a shock wave that comes out immediately. And on this blast slide, you see this spherical structure that's coming out from the, from the uh, uh, explosive device. And that blast wave goes through the body very quickly. It also goes around stationary objects, so walls and things like that. that uh, and there's a lot of controversy. Is this wave actually causing injury to the brain. The second phase is the actual concussive event where there's, uh, the person is blown down uh, or blown sideways and they can actually feel the force uh, of, the, of the pressure of, of the uh, explosion. And the third is the debris field. And so debris will be flying out and there may be projectiles and things like that. Now, mild traumatic brain injury is an injury to the brain in the, at the lowest level, at its functioning level. It's not so much the penetrating injuries that we're talking about in this presentation, although loss of limbs and penetration injuries are significant and can cause great um, problems for the patient who's a victim. This is a, one of the newer units here that has uh, an inch of steel all the way around the entire unit. It still has a gun turret on the top, but uh, penetrations are very uncommon. However, these vehicles can be blown 10 or 15 feet in the air and then a person can have an acceleration or deceleration injury similar to a motor vehicle event. When we look at the total number of traumatic brain injuries uh, in, this, in the last two wars, the Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, there have been about 3,300 penetrating brain injuries. These would be penetrations through the calvarium. There have been over 2,000 severe brain injuries that have required surgical intervention because of uh, hemorrhagic bleeds. There's over 33,000 moderate brain injuries and over 150,000 mild brain injuries. For reasons that we cannot explain, people who have mild brain injuries are more likely to develop substance use disorders. And those substance use disorders are manifested with alcohol, prescription opioids, or other drugs of abuse. This is looking at essentially 2000 through 2010, quarter three. Definition of TBI in October 2007 included loss of consciousness or decreased consciousness. So it's possible for a person to have a traumatic brain injury without the loss of consciousness. The term itself, TBI, is a little confusing because it really should be spinal cord and, uh, and brain injury. So traumatic spinal cord and brain injury would be a more accurate definition. But the definitions come from the CDC, the World Health Organization, American Academy of Neurology, the American College of Rehab Medicine, these are all very consistent in the way they're describing brain injuries. So a brain injury that has a loss of memory, a brain injury that results in an alteration in mental status, confusion, discomfort, slow thinking, decreased psychomotor speed, neurological deficits, and an actual macroscopic lesion. 
When we start looking at brain imaging, the problem is that we don't have the granularity necessary to image the brain adequately to identify if traumatic brain injury has occurred or not. So we have to base everything on history. If we had the macroscopic identification, it's probably going to be a severe brain injury or moderate to severe. If we look at the microscopic level though, we can see the axon in this cross section of the slide and there's a significant amount of edema that's underneath the neural lemma. And that edema changes the nerve transmission and there's microfibrils, fast and slow transport systems inside the neuron that are damaged also. Those types of changes don't have evidence on brain imaging with MRI, CT scan, or even the brain tracking software, but it does have an impact on the change that the patient has. Many people who've been exposed to blast injuries, they come back to the States and their family members say they're different. There's something different about them. We'll talk about that difference. After a person's been exposed to a concussive or explosive event, they have to receive a military acute concussion evaluation, which is called a MACE evaluation. Uh, Jim Kelly, who is the director of the National Intrepid Center of Excellence at uh, the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, is the person who helped develop this particular device. And in the device, we have one thing that's very interesting. They ask five words, or they, they give you five words, and they ask you to give them back. So you give them back when you first hear it, and then they interview you, and they ask how many of those words can you remember. So in this particular question, it's el elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, and bubble. And then would, the patient would repeat that, and then they would go through the interview, and they would say, can you remember those five words? Can you tell me how many of those words can you remember? So short-term memory seems to have a significant change in people who have mild to moderate traumatic brain injuries. These devices are set up so they can be put into PDAs and put into uh, smartphones so people can screen themselves to see if there's anything that's changed in the way that they can recall uh, immediate uh, stimuli. Every person who's been deployed has to have a post-deployment post health assessment. And that post-deployment health assessment covers a variety of areas, but in this particular area, it's actually looking at injuries or behaviors or symptoms associated with blast exposures. Early detection becomes important, and this is looking at a variety of studies that have been done by the military. And one particular study, 16% of Army soldiers returned uh, after combat exposure had screened positive for TBI. Another study had 15%. Uh, a third study had 19% of Operation Iraqi Freedom or Operation Enduring Freedom, that's Iraq and Afghanistan, veterans had positive findings of TBI. Uh, a fourth study had 23% and a fifth study had 18.5% of veterans. So we know it's a common event for people who are combat exposed. We start looking at the symptoms immediately after an injury. So the red columns are the acute symptoms, the yellow columns are the post-deployment symptoms, months later when they return to the States. Immediately after the injury, there's headache and dizziness. Uh, headaches about 80% of the time, dizziness about 60% of the time. And you see balance problems, irritability, and memory are actually way down to about 20% or less. However, after the person has had a time to heal, whether that's a month or two months or as many as 11 or 12 months, Headaches and dizziness have decreased dramatically, but balance problems also have decreased, but irritability and memory have had significant stability. So that if a person has memory losses immediately after a blast, the likelihood is going to be that they're gonna have memory losses late after the blast too. And that's one of the reasons why the Macy evaluation becomes so important. We do have a newer technology that's available all across the country right now. It's called brain tracking software. And the brain tracking software is an MRI with a three Tesla unit that has the ability to look at nerve bundles. And just like a tree, when you climb up a tree and the branch breaks, it always breaks at the crotch. Nerves are very similar. Wherever the nerve changes in direction and you have a bifurcation or a, a, uh, a separation of the nerve bundle, that's usually where the nerve is going to have damage. And when you look here, this is an example of the corpus callosum and you can see that the nerve bundle that goes uh, superior from the corpus callosum has changes. Now these breaks that you're observing here are not individual nerves. They are large bundles of nerves that are inside of the corpus callosum. As technology continues to improve and we have the ability to see with better definition physical changes, we can depend on that. But until then, we're going to have to depend on our interviewing skills, 
our ability to relate to the patient, and our ability to identify changes in behavior that have been critical towards their survival in this world when they return. This is the end of this discussion on mild TBI. This is the first of three discussions. The next one will be on post-traumatic stress disorder. The last one will be on substance use disorders. Thank you very much. Greetings, my name is Tony Decker and we're on the second section of the three-part series on traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, and substance use disorders. The second section is going to be on post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to make sure that we go over our disclosure again. I've presented numerous presentations uh, nationwide on these particular topics, but I am not representing the U.S. government in any way. I'm not representing the U.S. Army, the Indian Health Service, or the U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, organizations that I've previously worked with. I have no conflicts to report. The topic of PTSD is interesting because Galen, who was a surgeon in the Roman Empire, talked about this type of problem that men had who were exposed to certain types of emotional traumas in combat and it caused an emotional reaction to them and they were unable to fight as soldiers. The, the the concept became even more so in the U.S. as we we're traveling through time. We found out that during the Civil War there were some people who became rigid and catatonic during battlefield experiences. Uh, they were called railroad spine as their diagnosis. During World War I and World War II, shell shock, battle fatigue, traumatic neuroses, concentration camp syndrome were all terms that were used uh, for people who had experiences in the PTSD type experiences from the war. Vietnam was the first time that PTSD was actually identified as a syndrome uh, and it was called the Vietnam Syndrome. During the 1970s the rape trauma syndrome became uh, identified and it talked about women who had had sexual assault experiences with particular types of anxiety disorders and responses. In the 1980s PTSD was recognized in DSM-3 uh, also, it became an area that disability claims started occurring and by the 1990s PTSD became one of the highest compensated psychological injuries uh, uh, based on a variety of studies reviewing these types of claims. When we look at the comparison of PTSD and TBI, in this Venn diagram, we've got TBI having headaches and dizziness, we've got PTSD with flashbacks and nightmares, and then we have the overlap where both will cause attention problems, both TBI and PTSD can cause depression or be associated with depression, both are associated with sleep problems and insomnia, irritability and relationship disorders, and anxiety. Interestingly enough, the treatment for anxiety or one of the treatments for anxiety that has been a mainstay is the use of benzodiazepines, but there's very good evidence that, evidence that benzodiazepines do not benefit patients who have PTSD, especially those with military-based PTSD. Substance use becomes a huge problem in this area because this, this search for something to calm down their anxiety, decrease their suffering, can be, a, can be accomplished with substance use, but many times it spins out of control. And so the third part of our series is going to be talking about substance abuse and pain as part of the um, educational program. We start looking at this Venn diagram that has many circles in it. Substance abuse, PTSD, physical injuries and pain, traumatic brain injury, depression, anxiety, all those things become major contributors to the psychopathology a patient presents. When we look at TBI and co-occurring problems with PTSD, we see that pain, substance use disorders are the top two that we uh, can, can appreciate in evaluating this patient population. Changes in their sensory systems, ringing in the ears, change in perception, hyper-arousal hyper response because of any kind of stimulation, including tactile stimulation, which is part of almost all relationships of intimacy, and that can create all kinds of problems with the relationship. The criteria for PTSD would be re-experiencing symptoms, the nightmares, intrusive thoughts, avoiding trauma, cues and avoiding numbing, uh, avoiding trauma cues and avoiding numbing situations, hyperarousal or hypervigilance, and when patients have those types of symptoms, it creates a situation where their guard is up all the time. It makes it very difficult to deal with them on a psychodynamic basis to provide intervention services. 
So patients that come in to have bad dreams, nightmares, sleep disorders, emotional numbness, uh, and a common term that I hear from spouses is that he's different or she's different. Something happened when they were over there. And then they, uh, the way that the, the, the person who has PTSD deals with this is they feel they can't talk about these feelings. They can't relate to the people who they're intimate with. And then they seek refuge in a bottle or seek refuge in a pill. Consequences on a relationship basis includes low self-esteem, as we said, alcohol or other substances of, of abuse, employment problems. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in our unit is that if everything you thought came out of your mouth, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And that's one of the things that many of my patients who have PTSD and TBI describe is that they can't keep their feelings inside their mouth and it comes flying out. Then they got to deal with it when it comes out. Homelessness is a very common problem and a significant percentage of urban homeless populations are veterans. It was that way for Vietnam, it's that way now for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Trouble with the law is very common. Impulsivity can result in people doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And then a sensation of, a sense of isolation uh, can occur. We start looking at combat exposed soldiers, Marines, and other uh, service, service members. They, they relive the events that happened in the battle. And PTSD is very interesting. One of the ways that we treat this is with an intervention called prolonged exposure. The, the, the rationale for this is that you can't forget what you can't remember. So you have to help people remember what's happened. And the therapeutic part of this is that we actually help patients go through those traumatic experiences, help them process those, those experiences. The best way I have to describe PTSD is when the past haunts the present. And so in order to take care of that, we have to take the patient back to the past to work through those issues. And those prolonged exposure type interventions seem to have the best effect in regard to helping patients put the past in the past. We realize that it were terrible things, but we can't change those things. We have to move on. Military families have significant stressors, so it's not just a service member who's, who's injured in this war. Uh, frequent separations are the rule. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to have service members who've been on four, five, six. I've, the most I've had is a service member who had nine deployments. Long duty hours while they're uh, in the deployed status. The environment is very dangerous. But for the spouse, they have, no, they, they have the ability to contact their, their, their uh, significant other by Skype. But I had a service member call from Afghanistan re recently, upset that his son had started using the marijuana. He's yelling at his son through Skype and then doesn't know why his son does, won't respect him. And you can see how that distance is not going to promote any type of reasonable exchange and, and resolve a, a, a relationship that needs a lot of work on. Role ambiguity during deployment. Are they a parent? Are they a service member? Are they a spouse? Are they engaged in a mission? And so what happens is that it becomes challenging for them to work on those issues. When we start looking at mental health problems post-deployment, Iraq and Afghanistan have, have slightly different responses. These are data sets from 2006, and Afghanistan has become much more violent in the past six years. But somewhere in the area of 65% of people who are in Iraq up to 2006 had combat exposure. 46% had combat exposure in the Afghanistan situation. Suicidal ideation was seen in about 1% of the Iraq exposed and a little bit less than 1% in the Afghanistan exposed population. Psychiatric admissions for the Iraq exposed uh, population was 5.9%. It was 2.9% for the Iraq exposed soldiers and Marines prior to 2006. PTSD in combat exposed soldiers in general is hovering around 15 to 17%. Um, and it's it is a challenge for us from the standpoint of working with patient populations where sometimes asking for help is undesirable on the part of the, of the patient. They don't want to admit to these feelings, but working with them becomes an important part. So that wraps up the short PTSD vignette in our three-part series. The next part is going to be on substance use disorders. My name is Tony Decker, and thank you for listening. Greetings, my name is Tony Decker and I'm the uh, presenter on the topic of 
traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance use disorder in this triad of discussion. This is the third of the three, and the topic is going to be pain and addiction and substance use disorders. I should say that uh, although I work for the Department of Defense at the Fort Belvoir Community Hospital, I am not representing the Department of Defense or any other government agency. I was with Indian Health Service for 12 years prior to coming to the military, and I'm not representing Indian Health or the Health and Human Services. I have no conflicts to report. The topic of substance use disorders is an important one. If we look specifically at opioids, it's an interesting problem that we have. In 2011, we know that opioid use and opioid overdoses are the most common cause of accidental death in the United States. We actually have more people dying from prescription drug abuse and overdoses than any other form of accidental death. But for every person who dies, for instance, in 2009, there were 39,000 Americans who died from medication overdoses. Nearly 15,000 of them died from pain medication overdoses, accidental pain medication overdoses. But for every one of them, there are 10 people who are admitted to drug treatment centers for drug addiction. For every one person who dies from an overdose, there are 12 emergency room visits for people who overdose on medications and survive. There's 130 people who abuse their medications or alcohol, and there are 825 people who have substance misuse and substance abuse syndromes. So a death is the tip of the iceberg, and deaths have become a huge problem in our country. One of the things that I have on this slide is a Venn diagram that shows an overlap of people with PTSD, people with chronic pain, and people with traumatic brain injury. Now, this is a population set of combat-exposed uh, service members. 68%, there was a, the total population was 320. 68% had PTSD. 81% had chronic pain. And 66% had traumatic brain injury. But of the entire population, 42% had all three. So it tells you how common the three work together with pain, PTSD, and traumatic brain injury. Substance use disorder is highly associated with pain. And not every person who has pain that's given pain medication gets into trouble, but we've had a 400% increase in the amount of opioid prescribed in this country over the past 15 years. We've had over a five-fold increase in the number of deaths associated with prescription medications. So these are all challenges that we have to address. This slide talks about, in, in 2008, which is using the National, Drug Use, National Survey of Drug Use and Health, what are the number of patients ages 12 or above who, over the past month, have abused substances and is by substance? The, when you put all the psychotherapeutics together, it's 6.2 million people in the United States have abused substances in the United States. If you look at just the pain relievers, it's 4.7 million people. So these are huge numbers of people who are into trouble. Tranquilizers are 1.8 million, stimulants 900,000, sedatives 234,000. So again, a significant number of people. This is 2008. 2011, this is looking at new initiates to drugs. In other words, when a person starts to abuse a drug, we count and, the, and we find out, we survey the population, we find out what's going on in the community. The number one new drug that's being abused is marijuana, 2.6 million people. And that does not count the people who are receiving medical marijuana in the 19 states and the District of Columbia that have medical marijuana available. Pain relievers, 1.9 million people. That's 1.9 million new abusers of opioids and pain medicines. 1.2 uh, million new abusers of tranquilizers. When we break that down, in the, we have abusers of pain medications over their lifetime, abusers over the past year, and over, abusers over the past month. There are 34 million, nearly 35 million people who have abused pain medications in their lifetime, almost 12 million people who have abused in the past year, and 4.7 who have abused in the past month. The assumption is that it must be those teenagers. Those teenagers are the, the root of our problem, a lot of people assume. But the reality is, adolescents, a uh, time of experimentation, there's no doubt there's a population of adolescents who are at risk, are not the major area of problems. 
And when we look at the number of people who die from overdoses, 50% of those people who die from medication overdoses are between the ages of 30 and 55. So it's all the rest of people combined make up the rest, but half of them are between 30 and 55. So you see on the graph here, we've got some people in 12 to 17 year olds, and we've got as many as 1.2 million people using hydrocodone products that are between 12 and 17, that's the Vicodin type products. By the time you're in 18 to 25, it jumps to 6.3 million people. We're just talking about Vicodin, hydrocodone. And 26 and older, it's 15 million. So we, we can see that it's the older adult that's more likely to get into trouble with the opioids. One of the theories is that because it's a pharmaceutical, maybe it's safe. When in reality, opioids are not safe outside of medical management. So where do all these opioids come from? This graph comes again from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And 55% of all the opioids in the street are, from, are for free from friends or family. 9% are purchased from friends or family, and 5% are stolen from friends or family. And the thing to remember here is that means 75% of all the illegal and inappropriate drugs in the street are from friends or family. Now, some people think it's the internet that's uh, causing all the problem here. It turns out that uh, and the FDA and the DEA have very good data on this. It's only about half a percent of the opioids that are abused in the community are from the internet. Now, when a patient comes to you and they admit they have a problem, or you identify they have a problem and then they admit, I need help, that person has 99 other people in the community that have the same problem but do not seek help. So that by the time a person comes to a doctor's office and they are asking for help, it's critical that we're able to respond to that patient and give them the things that they need to successfully navigate into treatment. 95% of people who have substance use disorders don't even know they have a problem. 4% of people who have substance use disorders know they have a problem but don't do anything about it. And 1% of people who have a substance abuse problem know they have a problem, do it, and get the care they need. The topic of medical marijuana is a challenge for us. Marijuana does three things in general. It stimulates the part of the brain that helps a person forget. Forgetting, by the way, is an active process. So that's one of the problems in PTSD. And that's also one of the reasons that pe people who have PTSD, many of them will say they use marijuana because it helps them blunt that experience or blunt that, that effect that the post-traumatic stress disorder has on them. Drug interactions appear to be minimal, but unless you're buying marijuana from a known source, contamination can be quite high. The other thing that marijuana does is it changes time and space perception. By changing time and space perception, it may increase accidental injuries from the standpoint of operating heavy machinery or automobiles. Uh, California recently published a study in 2013 where 40% of people who were arrested for impaired driving had marijuana metabolites in their urine. If you're taking a medication, I'll call marijuana in medication in quotes, and it makes you forget things, will you remember that you took your pain medication? Will you remember where you put your pain medication? And if you can't do those things, combining opioids with marijuana can be a dangerous thing. I do agree that science needs to clarify how these medications have an impact on marijuana and how cannabinoids have an impact on these medications. The cannabinoid 1, CB1 receptor, and cannabinoid 2, CB2 receptor agonism needs to be better understood. The synthetics are being monitored very carefully. Uh, these are uniformly illegal with the exception of those who have been, have been approved by the FDA. And then natural marijuana, THC, comes in a variety of strengths now, and these are being better understood on research that's going on. But science has delayed and has gotten behind the eight ball, and we need to catch up from the standpoint of how to address these issues. Another Venn diagram. We look at 50-year-olds, and we look at illegal dr drug use. Marijuana makes up the biggest part of that population. Now remember, I already said that opioid use in the older population is associated with patients who've had untoward events and premature death. So 44.9%, this is again the 2008 National Survey of Drug Use and Health, nearly 45% of people over the age of 50 who abuse drugs abuse marijuana as their drug of choice. But 33% use opioids. 
and about 6% use opioids and marijuana. Of the people over the age of 50 who abuse other illicit drugs, only 6.1% of them use the other illicit drugs. So opioids and marijuana make up the biggest factor. And we see one of the consequences of untoward events in regard to the older population is a high rate of mortality for those between the ages of 30 and 55 who are using opioid medications. The state drug monitoring programs, which was instituted in 19, or instituted in 2005 with the NASPER legislation, uh, have required all states to have a mechanism to report drug use and drug prescription um, activity. If you look at the, uh, the 2013 uh, model, this is from the National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws, you can see that only Missouri has not passed legislation to monitor prescriptions. Arkansas, Georgia, Maryland, New Hampshire, and Wisconsin have passed the legislation, but they've not implemented the law or implemented the programs. All the other states have implemented the program. So if you're in one of the states that's implemented it, you should register, find out how to get information. So when that patient comes to you and you're concerned about their prior substance use, you can find out what they have been prescribed in the past. A lot of doctors and a lot of healthcare providers feel that they've figured out what is an addiction based on behavior. And so the next three slides are on, you know, what are less predictive of an addiction and what are more predictive of, of an addiction. A patient who complains that the medication is not working is not an indicator that the patient's addicted. The patient came to you for evaluation and treatment for pain and they're saying that this is not working. Now, they may be trying to manipulate you, but the reality is we'll get more details in regard to that patient later on. Patients who hoard their medication. So they had a root canal done and they were given 20 Percocet, but they only used up 12 of them, so they have a little bottle of eight Percocet sitting in their medicine cabinet. Now, that doesn't mean that the person's addicted. That means the person's trying to keep medication for a later date. Not a good idea, not medically indicated, but that does not indicate an addiction. Patients who come in and say, I have to have a specific medication. A patient states, I need to be on this, I need to be on Dilaudid because Tylenol 3 doesn't work for me. Now that's always an eye, uh, eyebrow raiser because we're going to watch that patient very closely, but we don't want that patient to have a situation in which they're misusing or abusing their medications. Acquiring similar drugs from medical sources other than the primary provider and it's only happening once or twice and it only happens when that primary provider is absent. So if I'm out of town and my patients can't get a hold of me and they go to the emergency room and they get medication, I'm not going to be as upset with that patient if they made an effort to contact me. But if it happens numerous times, that's, that's a poor sign. So single events, especially when the primary care provider is absent, should not be seen as an abnormality. Unsanctioned dose escalations only once or twice. The patient states that they had another injury and the pain became significant and they needed to have some kind of stabilization, especially a telephone call to help them out. Exaggerated pain scores in the clinic are not unusual because the patients realize that they have to say a high score to get their medication. These are all things that, that uh, are of concern, but they are not indicative of a addiction. Things that are predictive of an addiction would be people who sell their prescriptions, people who forge their prescriptions, people who steal their medication, people who obtain prescription drugs from non-medical sources. They're buying their Oxycontin on the street. People who have a concurrent abuse of alcohol or illicit drugs. People who have multiple dose escalations without notifying the primary care provider or the prescribing physician or, or provider. Aberrant administration of medication. So if a patient says that, well, the Opana helps out, but when I grind it up and snort it, it works a lot better, that would be indic indicative of a addiction. I always tell, say to my uh, patients that they have an affectionate name for their medications, my Gabby's, my Perky's, my Zanny's, those are bad signs. Patients who have multiple dose escalations and have prescription losses, and they say that they need to have more medications because they lost their prescriptions, are more likely to be from an addictive behavior. Patients who go to the emergency rooms and other providers on a regular basis to get their pain medications, again, highly suspicious of inappropriate or addictive type behaviors. Deterioration in function. 
So a person gets the medication for pain, but they're now laying in bed all the time and they're not, not able to do things. And a resistance to change, despite the therapy not having a benefit to the patient. You can't take this away from me. It's the only thing that works. But it's not working. Your pain's not out of 10. And so we need to work with the patient to help them address that. So on this last slide, we have several things here. We have three populations of patients, and I, call, I put, the, put them in a green zone, yellow zone, and red zone. The green zone patients are easy. They have a good diagnosis, a good workup. They're taking their medications like they're supposed to. They, they don't question if you're doing anything to check on how they're doing, functional assessments, medication counts, urine drug, drug screens, patients are compliant, and all the lab tests are coming back appropriate. The red zone's easy too. Patients been stealing your medications or, or borrowing medicines from other people. The drug screens are positive for cocaine. Those things are pretty easy because you say you can't be on these medications. My patients live in the yellow zone. You tell them to send them down for a drug screen, they forgot to get it. You tell them to bring their bottle in, the bottle's empty. And they say, well, I, I don't know what happened. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they're addicted, but it does mean that we have to ratchet up our supervision and our monitoring of those patients. What happens to the patient who's out of control and needs to stop? Well, we need to have, uh, uh, we need to have a couple paths. One of them is we stop the medication, realize they're going to go into withdrawal, we have to rescue them. We could use buprenorphine for that. We could use methadone for that. And the methadone has to go into an opioid treatment program, so that means that they have to go to a treatment clinic, whereas buprenorphine can be prescribed if you have the waiver. For patients who are going to taper the medication down, there's a variety of taper processes, and I would recommend that people look at those uh, in the manual from the standpoint of how to taper a person off of different opioids. So this covers the three areas that we wanted to talk about. The first area was traumatic brain injury, a common injury that we're seeing uh, both in the military population but also in the civilian population. Post-traumatic stress disorder, very common in our military population but also very common in our patient population who had childhood traumas or adult traumas, including physical traumas. And then substance use disorder and how it relates to traumatic brain injury, substance, uh, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. The goal was to bring all three of these together. I hope you've had the opportunity to see the other presentations. My name is Anthony Decker. Uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in this program.